thing. Yeah, Google Trends. Crazy. Yeah. So, right. Sicky, you ready to do this thing? Yeah, let's do this so I can go back to bed. <laughs> <clears throat> Get you some, like, thing of Robitussin. That's what you need, by the way. Tussin. Tussin. Oh, that did me justice last but week. Tussin. Yeah. <laughs> From fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, this is Pod Therapy. Real people, real problems, and real therapists. You can submit your questions anonymously at podtherapy.net. Or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. This week on the pod, Nick is feeling under the weather, so contributions will be minimal. However, Jacob is officially starting his therapy internship and will be filling in the gaps. (laughs) Take it away, Jacob. (laughs) Tell me how that makes you feel. (laughs) (laughs) And now, broadcasting from the churn, that guy's Dr. Jim Jobin. I'm Nick Cageman. It's time for some pod therapy. I would love see jacob do that i I still am on team jacob as life coach i think that that needs to be a thing is is tell me how that makes you feel is that not just the whole gig that's all you do yeah Yeah, yeah. you just you just that seems like the whole gig you nod thoughtfully took us uh two years of graduate school and then yeah 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 two more years of internship to get that that's essentially what it's it's, it's a lot of work on one one question you know (laughs) how does that make you feel i always feel really fun or not funny but like ironic when i do ask that question I almost so dodge that question. Yeah, I don't want to yeah. ask it because that's the yeah. classic question. Because they're just going to laugh at you. But yeah. sometimes <laughs> you have to ask that, and I always feel yeah. weird when I do. <laughs> and, like, and thankfully, everybody, you know, usually is in the middle of their own thoughts. And so when I ask that question, they generally are, are thinking about it. And they're like, yeah, that's a good question. Like, here's, And so they're processing it. But, like, I'm always waiting for somebody to just look at me and be like, really? <laughs> like, that's what you're going to ask? Like, of course. Of course I'm interested in that. But it's, like, such a simple question. But it, it's so powerful you think about it. We don't talk about how our feelings are. Most of right. the time we're well, hiding the, them. The therapeutic value of using that question is because usually the person is not focused on their feelings in the moment. They're right. They're focused on Some, anger what's or, or something, some kind of injustice or something that's going on. And then right. they're not, like, it's it's about the event and it's not about the emotion. Ah, uh, Yeah. So, but so, yeah, I, I'm the same way too. Or I like, I, I will avoid using that. I feel costs. that Jacob I can really, hobble his way yeah. through a half hour. I think he's got a solid half hour of skills that he could just before, work before in. somebody notices. Before, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, oh, no, no, no. I think I can. You, you, Why you do you not understand pants? the level of bullshitting that I'm capable of. Uh, I, think I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm capable of a couple of sessions. <laughs> I think he can get through it. <laughs> he can get through a couple of them. Yeah, yeah. In the beginning, it's mostly them talking about what's going on in their life anyway. Yeah. I feel I feel like I feel like the uh, the the opening the opening bit is just like picking out the right outfit. That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> looking like a therapist when they walk yeah. in. Yeah. You definitely need the the sport coat with the patches. Yeah, yeah. The get elbows. the tweed. Yep. <laughs> Uh, I feel I like that would get happen. me through two sessions just by I itself. Think so. I he's think he's so. he's really figured it out. You know, so much of this has to do <laughs> just what you're wearing. No, but honestly, Does this guy if you feel did, like a therapist, you know. And keep the long hair, but just put it in a ponytail. Yeah, yeah. Oh, just, he'd just kill. That would, he'd yeah, kill. That would be. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. He'd, he'd kill with that. Absolute yeah. right. therapist. He's got it. Oh, yeah. Uh, he can get the look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, uh, nail it. A, a, an antique pipe sitting yeah. on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't smoke it or address it, but it's, it's just, just. It's just there. It's just there. But, it, yeah. but it's prom. It's it's not displayed like prominently, <laughs> but it's displayed prominently <laughs> enough that you're gonna notice it. Yeah. You know, it's so funny how much actually does go into like how you design an office or like yeah. it and, looks and, like a therapy office. It, well, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. in theory, like you want it to have a certain kind of vibe or feel. Like, oh no, I am. I am confident that I could bullshit my way through at least. I a few could sessions. see him working it. I could see him working it. It's funny because I generally want to believe that a fully licensed therapist would be better at this than Jacob. But honestly, I've met some that I think Jacob would be better. <laughs> I think he could just wing Seriously. it, and I oh, think he would I just I know I'm better than somebody. <laughs> there is somebody he's, out there. He's saying, in this room, I know <laughs> I'm better. In this room. <laughs> I'm in the top two in this room. <laughs> I think I'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, though, that's funny, though, man, how much actually goes into just, like, carrying yourself the right way and, and how is you there, design your space. Is there a way that we could just set this up that would not cause you guys to lose like a license or something. Yes, yes, there is. You there know what is. it's called? 
Life coaching. Life coach, man. Go for the life coach <laughs> There's thing. There's nothing no, no, no. stopping you from doing it. Uh, no, no, no. I don't, I don't want to set this up and actually do it. I want to, <laughs> I want to set this up and, like, do it once. <laughs> like hidden and camera. Just see, and just see how long Here's I can, we'll I can do, drag Jacob. somebody along one day, thinking that I'm a therapist. One day I'll be too sick to go in, uh-huh. okay? And I will text you on that day, and I'll tell you all my new patients of the day. And right. then you just go in and introduce yourself as me and just wing it. Yeah. And then the next time I see them, I'll be like, yeah, I shaved. <laughs> like, right. I got a haircut and I shaved. And uh, I know I, I seem different. <laughs> a lot of people think I'm a different guy the second time around. So he's going to impersonate you. Because you remember what happened last time he did that. What? When he, oh, my, my mom? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. I'm Jim. Oh, I'm, I'm Jim. so smart. My mom was like, identity <laughs> theft is real. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Nick, I was really worried there that you were going to tell, tell him about his wife. Oh, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> she no, still we, doesn't know. <laughs> we swore we'd never Jim. talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm Jim. I'm Jim. I know. God, why do you keep saying that? It's the most interesting pillow talk I've ever heard. Oh, my God. Oh, also the pillow thing. Everybody, My wife pillow? went to, yeah, that thing. Why uh, are you saying that with an E? Because that's how it should be. So <laughs> at Kohl's, they were like on discount. And so we went and bought like what a whole bunch of these uh, pillows. <laughs> And um, there's not an E in it. My wife and children are now giving me shit. Like my son and my four year old daughter. P E L L O. My daughter asked uh, my wife, she's like, why does daddy talk like that? <laughs> I've never been so insecure about the way I talk. And then, and then, the, then I just popped out from behind the aisle. I was like, how does that make you feel? <laughs> yeah, how does that make you feel, honey? Yeah, well, what was it last week at, after we wrapped? Uh, I said something and, and Jacob called me out for that too. And like, uh, it yeah, was, what was that? A tribute? Yeah. It was, I was talking about. Oh, yeah, attribute. Okay, yeah, uh, that thing. Yeah. (laughs) So we were talking about a football player, and I was like, he has a a really good attribute, and and just the air left the room. (laughs) You just see Jacob so disappointed. (laughs) (laughs) Like, it just always happens where he, like, slowly looks up in silence. (laughs) It took us both of a beat. (laughs) (laughs) What what did I just say? (laughs) (laughs) See, that doesn't seem wrong to me. A tribute. It's an attribute. You have an attribute. That's that's how it is. You're that, okay. All that, right. I don't think I'm way off on that one. I think that, that I think there's a lot of people that say it like that. I mean, you're right. definitely right. way off on it. Yeah. Uh, no, you're. <laughs> we'll, we'll take a vote. We'll, we'll have to put this one out there too. Great. Let's take a vote. Thing. All in favor of attribute. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> All in favor of attribute. Nay. <laughs> <laughs> it's unanimous. Damn yes. it. I, I have been voted down. So this is a witch hunt. That's what this is. <clears throat> right. Anyway, Nick. Anyhow. So uh, you vetoed my original idea for the A block. Because uh, we've already talked about Cause it. Because it turns out we've already done it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I had a whole script where I was like, we're going to talk about conversion therapy. Yeah, you don't there's remember new... that? Well, okay, so once you told me, hey, man, we already did this, then I was like, oh, yeah, we already did this. Yeah, because people wrote in and were yeah, upset with you. they were upset, which is yeah. a good reason to go back and do it again so that I can fix whatever I did wrong. <laughs> I don't remember this. What were they upset with no, you about? This was, were, I, I don't this I can was do, before we were recording I can here. do no uh, right. No, it's because it was, it was about the law. Well, uh, yeah, conversion it's therapy. super relevant because there is a new federal law that's right. being proposed right now. And right. that was, I think when we talk about What conversion are we talking about here? Gay, gay conversion. straight gay. Okay. So like people that are identify as bisexual or homosexual uh, doing some kind of therapy right. to like come to, you know, the straight side or whatever. Usually it's through can, a church or something like that. Yes. yes. Yeah. So can I, can, yes. I, can I explain your side of the argument and see if I get it right? Okay. Because we're both against conversion therapy. I think this just became our A block. Because, god damn it. Uh, We're both against it. Because there's there's no evidence to support it. No, it's it's a terrible idea. It's it's terrible. It doesn't do anything. It causes more damage, more harm than anything. It's a terrible idea. Your disagreement was it shouldn't be a law banning it. It should be based off of uh, the, the disciplines board of... Yes. So, like, board of examiners, essentially. Yes. All your... of the board of, uh, okay, so all oh, of wait, the ethical. That's just, that's just like a, the it's board a of examiners argument. is just a therapy board thing, though, right? right? So, based yes. off of your license. So, if you have a license, then you have to report to that board. So, if you are doing yes. something unethical, then the board can take away your license. It but if I, already... in my life coaching practice, you start can doing, do it, start and doing that's it, my point. Then there's, a, there's no board there's overseeing that. There's nothing. And that's why these laws are stupid. So, like, Ted Lieu, uh, congressman in, in, I think, Oregon or Washington, he, he was passing a federal law. He wants it out there where it would ban conversion therapy. 
everywhere coast to coast. So it'd be federal. Right now, there's like, I think, 13 or 18 states that already ban it. Okay. But they only ban it for healthcare providers. So I can't do it. Jacob can. But I wouldn't do it anyway because it is already forbidden by our ethical codes, and the ethical codes are legally actionable codes. And by the way, I would not do it uh, cheaply. you wouldn't. (laughs) (laughs) If you want to work with Jacob, you better pay top dollar. It's price. (laughs) (laughs) He has a lot going on. Yeah. You got to really, you got to incentivize. <laughs> but that's my point. So, like, even the Nevada law that went in, there's an exception for pastors. Those were the ones who were doing it anyway. So, right, what the hell did right, your law right, accomplish? Right, right, right. So, as soon as the American Counseling Association, the American Medical Association, the Psychiatric Association, the Psychological, they've all forbidden it. And if you look up, like, the Nevada Board of Examiners, for instance, for, for uh, clinical professional counselors, in that Board of Examiners, it says, we adhere to the NBCC Code of Ethics. If you break that code of ethics, you can be legally punished in the state of Nevada. Right. So that standing code of ethics forbids this. And Therefore, what kind of punishments are we talking about from this board? You lose your license, or you can be you know, sued, you can malpractice, be put on pro- probation okay. for a while. Yeah, and and, and so like you know, there's there's pretty bad consequences. But that's not like you're... legal probation. That that's like no probation from them. Okay. Yeah, for the for your well, license. But yeah, but it's already a legally actionable thing. If you if you malpractice a healthcare discipline, it's a civil it's a civil matter. No, it could be it could be criminal. It could oh, be okay. a very high punishment, oh, like okay. the guys who overprescribed opioids. They're going to jail. Gotcha. Okay. You know, because oh, yeah, they malpracticed, yeah. right? And so like. It's already very severe consequences, but whenever you write a law that says, okay, we're going to punish all the people who are forbidden from doing this anyway, and then you, you just leave the door open for everybody else. So, A, I, I, my argument is I don't think it's actually useful. I don't think it accomplishes what you want to accomplish. But, B, I'm not even a libertarian. But the libertarian in me, that little percentage of me that's that's really okay with this argument, says, I don't think the government and and the current mainstream of like what culturally is being discussed and what's in the news, that shouldn't be codified into law to regulate healthcare disciplines. That's why we have ethical boards. Okay, I can Because those of, guys do science. I can right? kind of get behind him on this. Yeah. Because, like, if we all of a sudden come up with, oh, if you use um, uh, this kind of scalpel in surgery, it could hurt people. Okay, let's pass a law saying you can't. No, you don't need to do that. Yeah, they cause... already have a governing board that can make rules based on science and change that monthly if they need to. So let me ask you this. You can't change a law like so that. So if it's being done through a church, if a church is doing conversion therapy, Right. The the things that they do in these conversion therapies are often uh ethically questionable at best. Well, there is no ethic because they're they're not healthcare providers. No, no I, don't, I don't mean like so they're just doing I, I don't what they mean do. like your your uh your it's spelled harmful. out code of ethics. It's I, I mean just like ethics. Yeah, I, I it's mean just like general ethics. Human ideas. Yes, it's yes. a bad idea. Yeah. Right. And a lot of times there there's some uh physical punishment that goes into it and everything else. Not necessarily, but yeah, th- that's, I'm that's not happened I'm in not the past. I'm not saying it's in there. It, right. It's definitely in there, but the, a lot of times that is that kind of like thing. Like electroshock and stuff right. like that. And so you get in real fast to, is this just child abuse? And that's another question, right? Because that's that's another part of the debate. So like if you're talking about somebody that's under 18 years old. But the problem is you get over into religious practice right. versus law. Right. Right. That's a if whole other thing. If it's a religious practice now, if right. it's your your uh, firmly held religious beliefs, right? Then, for some reason, that's a pass. Well, no, because you can't abuse children. Whether you're doing that in the Catholic Church, okay, so that's coming out. It's not, they don't just go, oh, it's our deeply held religious belief that pedophilia is okay. Like, no, 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 you go to jail. So, like, that's already forbidden. Right, so these laws that they're they're writing well, are not about, about is where the line is. Right, no, because the the laws are not being written saying this is to protect children from electroshock or like you know waterboarding them away from being gay. That's not what we're talking about. If I force a child to stand in a room with a poisonous snake, right, at my house, that would be child abuse. Yes, and if we I already do have it, laws. If I do that at a church, well, I if don't... I'm at a snake handling church and I do the same thing. It's not child abuse. I think it would be. I don't know. I think it, it would be on, too, but I'm but, telling you it's not. But, but, yeah. Okay, but that, <laughs> yeah. that discussion of where the line is with religious organizations versus their adherence to actual laws, that is different than what I'm talking about. <clears throat> I'm speaking as a healthcare provider and saying I don't like laws that tell healthcare providers this is what you can and cannot do based on science because we already have a better method to tell us what we can and cannot do. And All it right. shouldn't be yeah. legislators getting to decide that right 
write laws that can't be overturned or finally new ones. Like if you read Ted Lieu's law, dude, it would scare you. And, and like you are never going to do this. I have never done conversion therapy ever, but I have had cases where people want to discuss their sexuality. So like if you have a Muslim man and he's devouted, you know, Muslim, he's, he's deeply, this is his faith, right? And he is starting to grapple with the fact that he is gay. But this is very hard for him because everything about this bothers him. Like it bothers him internally. It bothers him with his culture. He, he has very serious consequences for living this out. You know, he will be disowned and there's no going back and blah, 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 blah. You can't just flippantly be like, oh, that's not a big deal. Let's embrace who you are. You have to respect this human and say, hey, man, let's, let's journey this together, right? But by this law, if you even are in any way interpreted as like – discussing with them the possibility that they're not gay, that is legally actionable. And that's a very dangerous thing to be enforced in codified law because our ethics boards, they are willing to step into the weeds with us to say, what were you doing? I was allowing this person the space to discuss their sexuality. Were you actively trying to convert them to something they're authentically not? No, that's never our goal. Like, no, but I was giving that person space to talk about it. Under these new laws, it's dangerous to even do that because now I could be acted against if somebody wrongly interprets what I was intending to do. That's too dangerous. We can't have that. You know it what? minimizes the person. Fine. You can do conversion therapy, Jacob. Ah, thank God. <laughs> Thanks, Jacob. That's really what I was going for. So I just don't like now the laws. Now let's get back to the snakes. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, like, that's another part of this that really bothers me is, like, I believe in the dignity of the patient to be allowed to talk about whatever they want. And if they come in and say, I am internally struggling with my sexuality, that is extremely common. That is extremely common. They should be allowed to do that. But if you tell me, if this kind of a law passes and you tell me, hey, one of the things I'm here to talk about is I'm internally struggling with my sexuality. I might be gay. I don't know how I feel about that. I would decline the case. If this law passed, they'd be like, I'm sorry, I can't take this case. Why not? The liability is too high. Because if you internally struggle with this and then later on look back on your therapeutic time and don't feel that we resolved anything or whatever, you still have issues with this, you could take me to jail. And, like, I'm not going to risk that. You see what I'm saying? Like, I just think it bottlenecks yeah, the I problem. Mean, it's not the, the effective way to regulate any healthcare discipline. You don't right. do it through law. You have boards that do it, and they're boards of your peers, and they hold you to best practices. It's already illegal to do conversion therapy because our boards won't let us. You don't need to put it in law and then put all these. If I showed you the, the law, it is so poorly written that you'd be like, oh, my gosh, this, is, this could be enforced against anybody talking about sex ever. And it's way too vague. And that's why those guys shouldn't be the ones regulating a discipline, right? That's why you prefer your colleagues to regulate the discipline because they are not going to get in here and be like, well, by the letter of the law, you're not allowed to talk about sex. Like they would be like, right. hey, what was your intention? Right. What was your modality? What was your goal? Like they, they are intelligent enough to get into it with you. So that's right. my beef with the conversion therapy laws. I don't think they need to be written. I don't think they're effective. I think it dishonors the patient. I think the patient has the right to come in and, and grapple with whatever they need to grapple with. And I think we already have a way to regulate this. So I guess what I'm, I already said, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Throw snakes at children. What I'm, what I'm already, I guess <laughs> that's what, what I'm, I'm trying to say. What I'm understanding you saying, though, is that e essentially it doesn't affect the people who are doing it anyway, because the people who are already doing right. it exactly. are, don't have a governing board anyway. You're passing a law against people that are not allowed to do it <clears throat> just to right. get the headline. Right. And, like, I understand the symbolism of that. Like, I understand that it, it symbolically communicates rights and dignity to the LGBTQ community. Sure. And I think there's so much value to that. Like, I'm on board. But this is not an effective strategy. If your real goal was to stop people from doing this, you're aiming your gun at the people that can't do it. Right. We can't do it anyway. Like, I have had cases. Because, you know, that I, I coordinate a lot with the religious community, right? I have had cases... And I don't like the youth argument because I think that's a whole nother kettle of fish because, like, there's already a lot of laws that protect kids. But I have had a situation where I had something like a 16-year-old child um, who was brought to me by their fundamentalist Christian parents who said, our, our child is identifying as gay. We've just discovered this. We're bringing him to you. And we picked you because you identify as a Christian. We want to work on this. And my alarm bell, and this was years and years and years ago. That's this is, terrifying. That's a big moment, right? <laughs> yeah. And my alarm bells immediately went off because 
not because of any laws. This was way before there was a Nevada law or anything like that. It's just simple best practices, right? And so I sat those parents down without their child and I said, I am totally willing to engage your child and like hear their truth and give them a safe human and a safe adult to talk to about this. In no way, shape, or form am I going to participate in anything that looks like changing your child's sexuality. I don't believe it's possible, and I don't believe that's my role, and I believe it's abusive. And they were like, okay, no, 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 we're not asking you to do that. Like, we just want to make sure our son is safe. And I said, okay, so, like, if your son is dealing with depression and feeling suicidal, and a big part of that is joined with his own self-exploration of sexuality— because of his religious culture and because of the juxtaposition of his new sexuality and his religious culture, and now he's feeling depressed and suicidal because of that, that's my role. I'm a therapist. I'm going to guard for We'll safety. talk about that. Yeah. Right. And so I was like, I'm cool with that, but I'm not going to f- change anything. And they were like, cool. I wrote that out in a legal statement and had everybody sign it. And then had the kid brought in with the parents, re-explained it, had the kid sign it so that everybody knew this would be a safe place I am not trying to do. And that was way before there were any laws. How old was this kid? About 16. Huh. Yeah, and and so there you go. Like, again, my goal was, hey, are you suicidal? Are you depressed? Let's deal with that. But we ended up talking a lot about his newfound sexuality, right? But, like, if there's a law on the books that says, oh, my gosh, blaring red light here, I'm not even going to take that case because I'm not going to risk the liability. Like, why would I do that? What if at any point mom, dad, or child feel that I was – or what if child down the road feels that mom and dad were so unaccepting of them and that I was a weapon against that child? Even though I never was, like even though I took all these stances to protect the child, if the child in their hurtingness misinterprets what I was there for or the parents say, well, that's why we hired Jim was to fix you and now the kid's taking the parents' words for it, now I'm going to jail. Or or like I'm liable to lose everything and I'm not going to risk that. So I won't take take the work. Not necessarily going. To I'm not jail, going back to prison, Nick. To, you're, you you are going to have to defend <laughs> He's your position. Too pretty. I'm too Which pretty. Ultimately, <laughs> I mean that's that's a liability that we have regardless. We're always going to have that liability, and it always yes. comes down to documentation. It does how well we can document what we're doing in our but sessions. That's because, because whether you're it's talking a law, to a board, right? I know, but whether it's a law or if it's a board. From your position, it's kind of the same, is it not? It's not, because the board is is judging me by a very nuanced code of ethics that doesn't say yeses and nos, blacks and whites. It talks about skills, best practices, evidence, and intentions, whereas a yeah. law doesn't. A law is not interested in that gotcha. kind of stuff. It just says, thou shalt never talk to a child. or not. It's not even about kids. You know, I don't want to, anybody listening to get confused by Jacob's point. It's, we're not talking about kids. We're talking about in all situations, if somebody presents a sex sexuality a you will under no circumstances ever influence that person towards sexuality b and like we don't as a general rule try to influence anybody anywhere but that doesn't stop that person from ever misinterpreting something and now i could be enforced upon by that law instead of by a board who would have taken the time to like understand the ethical nuances but you can still have snakes in your Clinical practice. Yeah, I still use yeah, them. Yeah, yeah okay. I think it's a big part Leeches. of what helps. I just, I really Leeches, wanna, bloodletting. I, really, I, really I have wanna, a very diverse practice. I really want to go back to the snakes. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I, just, I keep going back to kids with it is, is right. that's that's where the damage. That's the bright line. Usually happens. Yes. Yeah. In, in this in this thing. Exactly. Like, I'm sure that there are cases of adults going in and saying like, I want. I, you right. Know, I, I, I need I, to. I, deal I'm, with I'm this. homosexual and I want to be heterosexual and whatever. And I'm, I'm sure that happens. But right. You don't hear about that, A. Yeah. And also, like, if I go in, like, if I came to your practice and said, like, I, I want to change my sexuality. Right. I'm an adult. But this and law. And if I do. No, no, no. I get what you're saying with the yeah. law and everything. But it makes it illegal. I can't even say yes to you. I just don't have, I just don't have an issue decide. with. I can't think of issues that I have with that with adults. Right. It's about protecting children. Right. And I agree. I don't want anybody bringing a child. And that's, but that's the problem is these laws still don't protect the kids. Because the kids right. that were getting hurt it. were the ones being shipped off to like religious camps off in the woods. Right. Where it was right. like can't pray the gay away. And yeah. those were not therapists. No. Like these were pseudoscience practitioners that were out there in the woods hurting and people. And I think that's kind of the uh, issue that I've always had with uh, gay conversion therapy. Yeah. Is... Number one, the gay conversion part, which is bullshit, doesn't yeah, happen. Yeah, that doesn't happen. And therapy is a misnomer as well. It's not therapy. It's not yeah. therapy. yeah, exactly. Right. So, <laughs> um, I mean. It's targeted abuse. 
And it's right. basically psychological yeah. abuse. That's what. And I'm good with writing a law that says I no just, psychological just, abuse to children. I'm good with psychological <laughs> abuse. I'm good that's, with psychological that's abuse. That's exactly how I finished that sentence in my head. Yep. <laughs> psychological <laughs> abuse. I'd like a law that prohibits that. But what's interesting about what Jacob just said, I mean, I think when it comes to kids, we all hold hands about this. But here's a good question, and this is a good ethical question also, for everybody. I don't care about kids. Well, Nick, let me ask you this. <laughs> I don't either, but go somebody, ahead. Somebody, so let's say you're in private practice. You're not right now, but let's say right. you were. Somebody knocks on your door, and even though this is outside your scope, just play along. Um, they knock on your door, and they say, listen, I'm a 35-year-old man. I've been heterosexually married for the last 15 years. I am feeling as if I am gay. I am having very strong impulses for this. It's something that's always been lingering in the back of my mind, but I don't want to lose my wife. I have children. I don't want this, but it's happening. So grappling with this thing that I'm not sure if it's real or not, I'm here to talk to you, a therapist, about this because I don't know who else I'm supposed to talk to. Right. So here I am. That's my presenting problem. Yeah. By this law, if you even sit down and have that conversation, you could be legally liable. Because the law states plainly, thou shalt not in any way, shape, or form entertain or try to change the sexuality of somebody who presents as gay or bi and nudging them towards straight. But this is that's overly restrictive because the patient is asking for help, standing in the nuances of ambiguity of their own sexuality. We should be competent enough and professional enough to be able to stand in that complexity. Without sure. trying to influence, we don't influence anybody. Like, we right. try not to never, if somebody comes in and goes, ah, I'm a lifelong Republican, but I kind of like Obama, and I'm struggling with this because everybody in my family hates it. We don't go, hey, Obama's pretty good. You should like him a lot. Like, we don't do that. We just kind of enter into the complexity of that and, and help them sort it. But right, we don't try to move them anywhere. Ultimately, treatment is driven by the patient. It, it should be. But right. let me ask you, in that hypothetical case, would you take that case? Yes. You'd take the case. Yeah, I would take the case. But what would your treatment goal be? Uh, well, the treatment goal would be explore. Explore. Right. right. That's pretty much it. I yeah. mean, you can't, you can't say... It wouldn't be help Jeff figure no, no, out no, that no, he's no, gay. No, 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 no. Yeah. And see, I believe that that's just as harmful as help Jeff realize he's straight. You shouldn't influence their sexuality one way or the other. I mean, I can't help but influence people's sexuality because I'm so damn good looking that, like, it always is a factor in the room. <laughs> but yeah. besides that, I, I feel don't... like that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like maybe you've embellished that point. A bit. How does how does that make me feel? <laughs> like that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the best as part of his life coaching thing is he never asks you how you feel. <laughs> Let me always, tell you how I feel about this. How does that make me feel, you ask? But I didn't. It makes me feel great. Shut it. <laughs> <laughs> listen, I'm here to talk, okay? You're here to listen. Life coach. <laughs> you didn't come here because you got it all figured out. Yeah. You came here to hear me. <laughs> I'm going to let my you know. Feelings. So anyway, I'm glad that A Block turned into conversion therapy anyway. But I just yeah. think all right. practice is bad. We're both absolutely categorically against it. I believe in guidelines to protect any vulnerable population. Yes. I don't think these are effective ones because they don't ultimately protect people from people that are causing harm. The right. therapists aren't the ones doing this, and it's already legally forbidden for us because of the guidelines we already have. Right. Ethical codes are enforceable legal documents in every single state. So I don't think you need to pass a law, but also those laws, I think, for those other reasons. I think it, it doesn't allow, like, an adult 35-year-old named Jeff to come in and explore what he's going through because I won't take that case. The, the legal liability is too high. I don't want to do that. So I think it does more harm than good in the end. I think it's mostly a show pony that people want to march in front of the press to say, look what I'm doing for this community. And, like, I appreciate that because I want to shine a light on what this monstrosity has been of conversion therapy, and I want laws to prevent it, but I don't think you you successfully protect that group by handcuffing healthcare providers. We were never the ones doing this. That right. being said, who doesn't like a show pony? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like show ponies get a really bad rap. Show pony, yeah. Right. Why is that always yeah. a bad thing? People like show ponies. Yeah, it's like, oh, there's a workhorse and the show horse. It's like, you know, the show horse yeah. is the good one. Right. <laughs> He's the smarter horse. I mean, nothing wrong with the workhorse, but I mean, like, everybody likes a good show pony. <laughs> Very true. All right, so have I won sure. you over to this argument? What are you thinking, Nick? Because no, I feel like I if agree. we're going to get I, hate I mail, really... I don't want it to just say Jim. I want it to also be a <clears throat> Nick's an idiot, Well, too. that's kind of my whole take on this entire podcast. All hate just... mail should be addressed to Jim. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but no, I, I, I definitely agree, and I would want to then explore, so what do we do about the other half of the problem? How do you is, solve it? Yeah. 
you know, because I, I, I agree. I, I don't, I mean, most therapists who are licensed in a discipline, right. They're not doing this anyway. No. Right. So no, it's not therapists that are doing it. That's I don't why, think it is. that's why I have the issue calling it gay conversion therapy. Cause right. it's not categorically. Therapists. It's not right. So I, it's definitely an issue that needs to be addressed, but I would agree with you. The law that's coming up, if we're addressing this towards their therapists, Right. And those providers, then it's not really accomplishing anything. So Right. And you know, the other thing about that law specifically that doesn't work, it's it it the way it makes this illegal is it classifies it as fraud. So if Jeff the thirty five year old comes to your office and pays you a fee to do work with you about this, by re, by receiving that funding by this law, if it were to be enacted, you have committed fraud. And that's how they're gonna get you is that it's essentially healthcare fraud because you've received some uh, cash for something that you can't legally do and right. so they're they're calling it fraud but again that doesn't solve the problem right. because the religious group that's doing this is not getting a fee that's right. just their entire thing they're a nonprofit it's a charity they don't care and they're not going to be so stupid as to have a paper trail that says oh an hour of electroshock on Jeff uh is 100 bucks like they're not going to do that they're going to donate $5,000 in a check and you know that's it and then they're just going to bring you to camp pray the gay away and hurt you or whatever these things are they're not going to have a paper so again it just I feel like it's just yeah. not the right tool to solve the problem it brings us into the spotlight when we're not the ones who cause this trouble and also it's a generally really bad principle to legislate what we do right we have a proper mechanism to, to figure out what's okay for us to do we don't need laws and assembly and senates passing this all the time because every time they do, we can never get into the nuances of that. We have to go to get lobbyists to try to figure out what we're allowed to do for a living when that's stupid. It's a waste of everybody's time. We're better off being regulated by our professionals. Yeah. No, I get it. I won I you it. over. That was easy. No, I, I was already there, but <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I mean, the only thing that maybe you and I have a little bit of a disagreement over is the impact of whether or not we would work with that person. Whether you take the case. Yeah, because ultimately, I mean, if we're talking about fear of being sued, that's like the biggest reason I don't do clinical work anymore. Right. It's because I'm tired of going to all these ethics trainings and you just sit there for eight hours <laughs> and they scared. tell you all the ways that you can be sued. <laughs> yeah. And you can be sued for anything, mm -hmm. like literally anything. Right. And so it doesn't really matter because I think, it, again, it all comes back to your your biggest defense is you have to be able to document, document. and showing that what you're doing is an evidence based practice. Right. It it is within the the scope of practice of your license. Right. And that you're doing it appropriately, and that's you, that's yeah. what you. And have when to you rely get to those on. blind spots, like I did, write up an entire thing that the statement, like I called it, my <clears throat> statement on. Uh, I think it was like sexuality therapy, and it just yeah. plainly said, I will not do these things. Do not ask me to do these things. Here's what I, I care about suicide. I care about the kid being depressed. I don't care who he loves. That's not my business. Right. If you have an issue with that as a parent, I'm not here to tell you how to raise your kid. I'm here to deal with the suicide and the depression. That's it. Right. But I documented the hell out of it, right? Yep. For that's fear of, do. but that's what I'm saying is if you pass a federal law about this, it's a calculated risk to say, do I want those cases? And maybe I don't. Yeah. Or, or you're dealing with another patient about depression. And then in session three, it comes up, hey, a big part of this is I'm, I'm 35 years old. I'm married 15 years. I have two kids and I'm dealing with my sexuality. I don't know who I am. And then you're like, uh, okay. <laughs> you know, like, do I continue down this road? Or have we already touched a place where now if I collect a fee from you, I'm committing fraud? Like, it's just too many things. And this is right. why we don't want that big, huge sledgehammer of the government being involved in these finely nuanced details. Right. It's too small. Like, it's it's a, what do they say? It's the, using a machete instead of the, the scalpel. Like, we need that scalpel level. So. Right. I don't know. But everybody that's listening, 100%, I want to say this as loud as I can, conversion therapy is bad, wrong, torturous, and horrible. Should never be done. Nick's right. It's not even appropriate to call it therapy. That is a categorical mistake. It is psychological abuse. Whatever a person's sexuality is, that is who they authentically are. There is no method that would actually change that. You can't do it. And in general practices to just understand a person and give them safe space to explore their truth, we do not influence it. Right. Thank you for clarifying that. I'm sure everybody just totally believes everything you're saying. At Sin City Shrink <laughs> is where you send your hate mail. Here it comes.
Here it comes. <laughs> and that's it for uh, Jim's Soapbox Hour. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we will discuss talking to your therapist about suicide. You're listening to Pod Therapy. This week's their producer sponsor is Smitty Scoop. Smitty is an American retail businesswoman, writer, television personality, former model, and convicted felon. As founder of Smitty Scoop Living Omni Media, she gained success through a variety of business ventures, encompassing publishing, broadcasting, merchandising, and e-commerce. She was written she has written numerous best-selling books, is the publisher of Smitty Scoop Living Magazine, and hosted two syndicated television programs. Smitty was convicted of charges related to the I'm Clone stock trading case. There was speculation that the incident would effectively end her media empire. But in 2005, uh, Smitty began a comeback campaign and returned to profitability in 2006. If you'd like to join Smitty Scoop and make the show possible, you can go to www.patreon.com slash therapy and sign up. Again, that's patreon.com slash therapy. And we're back. You're listening to Pod Therapy. Our next question is about talking to your therapist about suicide. Do either of you guys know who Smitty Scoop was? Uh, yes. Yes. Do you, okay, you both know? Murphy right, Brown. Murphy Brown's a fictional character. Jim's mom. God damn it. All right. How can I talk to my <laughs> therapist about suicide? <laughs> Hello, Pod Therapy. This is Stuart, a.k.a. Terrible Monkey Scoop, a.k.a. the manager of Steve Young in fantasy football, <laughs> a.k.a. the guy who beat Jim with a QB score of negative five. Yes. <laughs> I remember that week. Our hero. Mm, that was horrific. On to the real reason I'm writing. Hope you don't mind a good bit of setup before the real question. From basically the fourth grade onward, I had suicidal thoughts. These increased until I basically had these thoughts daily. Throughout middle and high school, I told myself to delay until I could graduate. I can't uh, commit suicide until my grandma dies, etc. Eventually, I still had the thoughts, but they became like a dull static in the back of my brain, with no force behind them like they had before. These thoughts started to dwindle in college, to only once a day, then once a week, and now rarely ever. And when they do appear, there's no real force behind them. I can easily realize how ridiculous they are. I have never seen a therapist about this, and at this point, I don't see it as a problem. Those type of thoughts almost never occur, and when they do, there is no force behind them, and I immediately realize that they're just ridiculous. Is there anything I should be wary of or look out for in the future? Thanks for the help, and FYI, the Saints are going to destroy the Panthers no matter who is playing QB for either team. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate okay. that feedback, man. I don't know. Sounds like a smart guy. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And, got, it, and, got it together. And I remember, <laughs> uh, I don't know if I, I missed this part in the letter, but I remember in the original letter, maybe I, I mistyped it. Um, part of it was, if I ever did see a therapist and I told them about this, would they overreact? And I remember that was part of it, because that was the title of the the question was like, how should I tell my therapist about yeah. this? Because that was the fear in the original question of like, if I have had these thoughts, if I say that, do I just red flag myself and all of a sudden I'm in real deep crap? So it's a good question yeah. of, like, um, how do you talk to them about this? I mean, I would say no. Uh, I would say most likely the therapist is not going to overreact. No. I mean, I'm thinking about how I would handle this situation if you came into my office. Right. And I think Jim would probably handle it the same way. If you came into my office and you told me exactly what you had in the letter, I would say, okay, great. It sounds like you've developed some strategies. Right. Let's sit down and let's let's uh, develop a plan for how we're going to continue the stuff that you're already doing. Yes. And if we need to, maybe look at some ways that we can reinforce the things that you're doing. Mm. And then also maybe let's take a look at what are some signs that you would expect to see if it starts going the opposite direction. Yes. Some early warning signs that we can start taking action. Yep. And we would just create a plan based off Safety of that. Safety plan. Yeah. You're, I mean, even at this point with everything that you've said, I can't imagine a therapist is going to look at this and be like, oh, we need to put you in the hospital right, right. now or anything. That's only going to happen if you are a serious, credible danger to yourself or someone else. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And and so to the writer here, you know, it, at the end of your letter, you had said if, if there – is anything or what should I be wary of or look out for in the future? And at the end of the day, I think that there's two different things that I think I'm reading in this. And maybe Nick, you'll agree, or maybe you'll see something different. On one hand, earlier in his life, I think that there was legit suicidal ideation, right? right. Which is thinking about giving up, feeling depressed, feeling hopeless, um, beginning the thoughts of what it looks like to make a plan. Uh -huh. And, you know, we have different kind of like 
you know, we talk about uh, the baseball diamond in ethics and, and, and trainings when we teach people about suicide. You know, first base, second base, third base when it comes to suicidal risk. First base is like they're having the thoughts of, like, giving up. that They're not going to do anything about it, right? Second base is they're starting to think about how they would do it. And then third base is, like, they're starting to change real-life behaviors like they're going to do it. Like they're giving things away. They're writing letters, uh, substance abuse, things that look self-destructive. And now it's like, okay, this is a high, high risk. This is like first base stuff that he's describing. And I think over time it kind of devolved into what we might just call intrusive thoughts. Right. And that seems to be what he's talking about. And an intrusive thought, guys, there's a, this is a whole body of work, and everybody should look into this a lot more. But intrusive thoughts are these, like, repulsive, bothersome ideas that just kind of zap into our mind. And a lot of people wonder how real it is, but they're not. They're just like a little brain gnat. It just flies yeah. around, you know, and it annoys you. And it's like, hey, maybe we should give up. Or, hey, maybe we should turn into oncoming traffic. And, you know, yeah. you're not going to do it. I, I have those. Yeah. I have those I have intrusive those all thoughts. The time. Yeah. yeah. I have them all the time when I'm up someplace really high. Doll like, jump? Yeah. Like, oh. Just it's, it's that thought of, what would it be like if I jumped? Right. And I'm like... Why am I thinking that? Yeah. Like, that's when you reach back terrifying. and grab the rail. Yeah. <laughs> Just in that's case like, I do oh this. Oh, God. I'll have those thoughts. Like, I'll, I'll have something, you know, like heavy in my hand, like a, like a bat or something like that standing next to someone. Yeah. Just be like, you know, what would it be like if I just hit this person in the head with this bat? Right. Yeah. Right. It's like, yeah. I have no malice or ill will towards no. this person at all. Right. Yes. Uh, and just like, oh, that's weird. Yeah. That's a weird thought. <laughs> that's a see, weird thought. but you're yeah. able to dismiss it. Of course. And yeah. but the difference is I, I see a lot of people who can't they can't dismiss it, but they're very fearful of it. And right. they'll come in and go, Jim, what's wrong with me? You know, I'm having these intrusive thoughts that and it could be anything. It could be like Nick said, What if I jump off? What if I commit suicide? It could be like uh, Jacob said, What if I commit homicide? What if I hurt this person? I've had every version of it. I've had people sure. say oh my gosh, that person's really attractive. Um, what if I slept with them? I'm like, oh my gosh, did I just, you know, have an affair in my brain on my spouse? It's like, no. Like, right. And I'll always ask them, like, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine a million dollars in your pocket. <laughs> like, okay, and I'll reach in and get that. And they can't, and I'm like, so thoughts aren't things. Right. <laughs> like, thoughts have no power. There's nothing to them. They evaporate into nothingness. You're not accountable for them. They're nothing. And if it if the thought bothers you, that's further evidence of how untrue that thought is. It is intrusive and bothersome because it's not really your thought, because right. you're not going to commit suicide, because you're not a murderer, because you're not going to do that hor horrible thing. I mean, I'm sure there's like an evolutionary perspective why our brains have developed this ability right. to have these intrusive thoughts. And it probably has something to do, I'm sure it has something to do with survival, but over the years it's kind of been warped and kind of changed a little bit. Right. You know, like as far as, uh, you know, always having those thoughts of, of, of what if, it's almost kind of like a survival mechanism that's playing out. Like, yes. what if something jumped out right now and attacked me? Okay. Or what do I have with me right now as a weapon in case I'm attacked? Yes. You know, what, what strategies, what if I, I tripped and fell over this ledge, how would I, what would I do to catch myself or survive yes. it's kind of your brain's always planning out like all these hypothetical situations right. based off of survival and i suppose it makes sense that over the years then it, that maybe some of that changed into you know now it's like i have this baseball bat that i'm carrying what if i hit somebody with it exactly or what if i'm up on this you know this bridge and i i jump off what right. happens yeah and I, or what if I rob this, you know, like the, the convenience store man opens up the register and you think, what if I just knocked him out and grabbed Yeah. But like those thoughts to me are so inconsequential. And again, like a little gnat. It's like a thought gnat. It just buzzes right past you. It has no force to it, as the author talks that about. Was There's the no real band force. band in college. The, the thought gnats? Thought gnat. <laughs> <laughs> That's a damn good name. Yeah. I've, heard, I've heard much worse names. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're so inconsequential that to me... They're, they're on par with dreams. If people right. are like, what's the meaning of this dream? Is this my deep inner longings? You know, I had this dream that I did this terrible thing or that I, I you know, I did this thing that has in no way. Like, you know, we've all had that person who comes to us and says, I had a dream that I did something sexual that is not my orientation. Right. Either they're uh -huh. a gay person having a straight dream or a straight person having a gay dream. And they come in. They're like, does this mean anything? And 100 percent of therapists I know are like. Have you hooked up with anybody? <laughs> like, no. Okay, then it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, then you're probably <laughs> like, that's, just, yeah. that's just dead air, man. Yeah, that's just that's... your brain just is like a, a movie theater that just needs to put something on. It's like yeah. that dream that we all have about Jim's mom. <laughs> right. It's not real. Yeah. None of us have acted on it. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, my poor mother. 
She still has no idea what's happened on Ice Cream Social. <laughs> <laughs> she has no idea. So anyway, writer, you know, I think that, A, I like the way you're responding to it because I think you're giving it exactly the minimal amount of energy that it deserves. Mm-hmm. Um, but Nick's right. There should be conditions that you've already thought through that if this ever got worse, what would my safety plan be? And then also taking a look at what does worse mean? Yes. You know, like what are the small signs that would be indicators or yeah. landmarks to you that things are getting worse, that we are going in a different direction? So yeah. if I see myself doing blank, then I should be concerned. Or if yeah. I see this, then I should be concerned. And you didn't say anything to the contrary here, Ryder, but when you talked about how when you were young, one of the tactics you used was delaying, saying, well, I won't do it until I graduate, or I won't do it until grandma passes because I don't want to hurt grandma. Um, I think that that's a, a, a nuanced way to approach it. That's not the long-term strategy I like because it still makes room for this, and it's like this conditional thing. Um, if you if you were still doing that, if you find yourself still doing that, which you didn't say you are because you said this is almost nothing now, but let's say you were still doing that, I would want you to visit with a therapist and kind of unpack that because I think they would give you better strategies than the delay right. technique. I don't yeah. think that's a long-term way to do it. Yeah, I would agree. I, I was thinking kind of the same thing. Is if you were to visit a therapist, I don't, I don't know as if where you're at right now is something that warrants you to go into therapy, but if it's something that you wanted to do, go for it. I think I, I, I think it would be helpful to identify, yeah, what some helpful helpful steps some specific plans of what you're going to be doing and how you're going to be dealing with it. But, yeah. yeah, but thanks for writing in. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. And, you know, you do want to address the delusional disorder you have of believing that the Saints are going to outperform the Carolina Panthers. <laughs> um, seek assistance soon, and I hope that you get better. Might I recommend seeking out a life coach? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, we need to get uh, somebody to create coaching. a jingle for Jake. <laughs> Call the heavy hitter. <laughs> like something like that. It's just Jacob's life coaching services, but yeah. he never actually takes any appointments. Yeah. <laughs> the line is always busy. <laughs> no, no. We're on his business card where it has a phone number, it just says, I'll call you. I'll call you. <laughs> <laughs> if you need me, I'll know. I'll know. Whistle this tune. <laughs> oh my god, that would be hilarious. Like it's just attached to a dog whistle. Yeah. <laughs> it's like just blow this and wait. I will eventually get there. Oh, All thanks right. for writing in, man. Good question. Uh we're gonna take a quick break, and when we come back, we discuss knowing you're ready to have children. You're listening to Pod Therapy. This week's their producer sponsor is Jake Schneider. All right, listen to this, guys. This might help you figure out who the first one was. I know who the first <laughs> one was. Calvin Cortazar Brodus Jr. Known professionally as Jake Schneider, is an American rapper, singer, songwriter, producer, media personality, entrepreneur, and actor. His music career began in 1992 when he was discovered by Dr. Dre and featured on Dre's solo debut, Deep Cover, and then on Dre's solo debut album, The Chronic. He has since sold over 23 million albums in the United States and 35 million albums worldwide. Jake is currently co hosting a daytime television show with Smitty Scoop called Smitty and Jake. Jake's potluck. Eh, eh. If you'd like to join eh. Jake Schneider and make the show possible, you can go to www.patreon.com slash therapy and sign up. Again, that's patreon.com slash therapy. Very good. We're back. You're listening to Pod Therapy. Our next question is about knowing you're ready to have children. So you guys really do know who both of them are, right? Yes. Yes. I, I believe that Jacob does. I don't believe you do. Okay, I'll tell you later. Okay, because I have an apology. It's actually geared toward both of these individuals at the end. So right before I do it, I'll ask both of you if you know who it is. Okay, well, I can tell you right now. It's Who is it? It's Martha Stewart and yeah. uh, Snoop Dogg. Okay, but which one's which? <laughs> <laughs> Should I tell myself I'm ready to have children? Hey, guys, my husband and I are coming up on our first wedding anniversary, but we've been together for 12 years total. We are both coming to the point in our relationship where we want to start a family. It was an easy decision for him, but I feel like I'm having a hard time letting myself let go and start trying for kids. For the longest time, I kept telling myself that now is the right time and it would ruin or now uh, isn't the right time and it would ruin my life plans. Now is as good a time as ever, but I don't know how to get out of that not now mentality. It was easy to tell myself not now when I was in college or when we were both in crappy retail jobs, but now we are in great positions. It's scary to let go of all the control, and that is exactly what it feels like. 
Now I know that no one is ever ready to have a kid, but how do I at least not be terrified and have an anxiety attack when my period is a day late? Is this normal insecurity, or am I overthinking this as usual? Also, just to make a note, my husband is not being forceful. He respects my insecurity and is letting me make my decision on my own. He isn't a dick, I swear. <laughs> Thanks, Autumn Scoopasaurus Rex. Okay, this is a... I mean, do this you get anxious when you're late on your period, Nick? All the time. Ah, it's so it's so tough. Yes. Just um, a day, 24 hours, and you're starting to sweat bullets. I know it. Um, so one thing, I actually, as you're reading this, there's one sentence in here that I, I went back and I highlighted. Okay. Um, now is as good a time as ever, but I don't know how to get out of that not now mentality. Right. Okay. So my immediate thought right now is I don't think you – should force your way out of that not now mentality. Okay. I think that not now mentality is there for a reason. I don't think that's something that you go into therapy or you, you address or try to work yourself through. If you're not ready to have kids, you're not ready. And Mm. I don't think you should have to force that. And I mean, for me personally, uh, when I was younger, I just always assumed I was going to have children. Okay. Just because that's culturally how we're raised. You Mm -hmm. just, you, grow up you finish college you get married you start a family you have kids right and that's just what you do and then um i ended up getting married and even then we had thought that we were going to have kids but it was always like well not now Mm -hmm. not now not now not now and then finally we just got to that point we were both on the same page and like if we live the rest of our lives without having kids would it bother you and for me i was like no it Mm -hmm. wouldn't Mm -hmm. and she was kind of the same way and then we just decided no let's just Let's just not have kids, and that's fine. That's perfectly acceptable. But it seems weird in today's society to not have kids. Sure. But I think it's becoming a lot more normal now, Mm -hmm. a lot more accepted. But if if you're just in that spot where you just don't want to have kids, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, as long as both you and your spouse are kind of on the same page there. If not, then that's going to be a problem. But. You know, going back to how do we get out of that not now mentality and into wanting to have kids, I don't think there's anything you can do to make that happen. Okay. I think you're just kind of in that spot. So definitely, I think, I'm glad that that was your answer because I think that that interprets the letter one way that is available. I don't, because she's not here, so we can't ask clarifying questions. So if by that letter she meant, I'm not sure if I want kids, I think that that interpretation warrants your answer, which is... Hey, if you're unsure, don't pull the trigger. (laughs) Like you need to explore that for yourself and you're entirely okay landing on, I don't want kids and don't feel ashamed of that. And that's okay. Another way to interpret that letter though, is we do want kids. My husband and I both do, but I'm scared to take the plunge to have the kids. Historically, I knew it wasn't the right time. We were finishing college. We were getting into careers. Now the conditions are great, but I have this sense of like, oh my gosh, Am I ready for this? And I think that that is a fair feeling to have that doesn't necessarily question whether a person wants something, but the incredible demand of the thing, right? And so, like, it's the same thing, like, I want to join the military, but oh my gosh, when I think about what saying yes to this means, like, once you sign that document, there's no going back, you know, like, you're going to go to boot camp, you could be deployed, like, there's a lot of, I I don't know what the word is, but it's like this this fear of what could happen kind of thing, this anticipation because of the greatness of the decision. And I think parenting falls into that category, especially for women. Like for dudes, if you're like, hey, listen, I think it's time to have a baby, that is still a life-changing decision and you're going to be responsible for the rest of your life for this. But there is no amount of pain you're going to go through. There is nothing about this that's like, wow, am I ready to, to face what is considered one of the most painful things biologically a human can go through and still be alive? No, (laughs) I don't have to anticipate any of that. Whereas for the female, she's like, okay, if I make this decision, I'm thinking about the next calendar year and I'm thinking about everything that's going to happen in my body, everything that's going to change, how my lifestyle changes, what my home changes into, the medical conditions I'm going to be faced with, um, the uncertainties that come with that. There is so much that goes into this that even if you did want it, you could still have a ton of hesitance before taking that shot. Does that make sense? Yeah, I agree. And I guess I would also still, to some degree, have some of the same advice. Okay. Which so, is follow the, oh, no, if so, you're hesitating, don't yeah, do it. So, well, not necessarily completely, but I mean, 
going back to your analogy of I want to go into the military, but I'm afraid of this, I'm afraid of this, I'm afraid of this, then don't do it. Right. You know, you don't have to. If it's not something that – I mean, if it's something that you get excited about but you're just kind of nervous about, okay, then you can kind of work through some of the nerves and stuff. But right. if it's something that is actively stopping you in your tracks – from pursuing it, then maybe there's something deeper in there that you're just not ready to do. I'm open to that. And I think you're, you're on the right track of something. I, I just want to be careful not to close the door and say, follow sure, your yeah. reluctance. Sure. Because I definitely think there's something here to get at. And, and like, I think that another thing we have to appreciate is especially with women, that biological clock ticking is important. Right. And so for them, if they're saying, no, I authentically know that who I am as a human being is I want children, but I'm scared to take this plunge and I want to come over my stage fright, my fear, um, my fear of launch, because I know this is a destination that I want. Well, okay. Like, if that is something you've arrived at, then we want to respect what this, you know, anticipation and fearfulness is like for you, but also equip you to jump over that hurdle, right? And this is something you've talked a lot about on the show, you know, the five-second effect of, like, you know, how your first initial reluctance to do an action is the default position of your brain to reject anything that's novel and new. Like, it is a hesitance machine more than it's, like, an impulsivity machine. Right. And so you have to train yourself to leap over that. I, I relate to this writer if, if, again, interpreting her letter as the, the alternate way, which is I do want kids, but I'm not sure how to jump over this initial hurdle. I resonate with that. Because, like, for me, that was always my answer. My wife and I got married. We both wanted children. I wanted to be a father. But, like, it was never the right time. So she was like, hey, I think it's time. And I was like, no, um, I need to be in my career. We need to own our own home. I was always moving the goalpost. Right. And so she's like, Jim, conditions are never right to become a parent. Like, you don't – when you're in your 50s and, like, you finally have, like, an IRA – like, I literally was like, no, we need to have this much in the bank, this much in an IRA. We need to own our own home. We need to be in our careers. We need to graduate from this and and be done with that. And she was like, you need to also respect my biology that if you delay this for 15 years, it puts me in a different position biologically that's not fair. And, like, how old I want to be when I'm raising my child and the way I'm imagining my life and being youthful enough to go to field day and stuff. Yeah. You need to respect that, too. And so it was a very dynamic conversation where I was legitimately fearful. And and I remember that feeling of hesitance of being like, ah, is it the right time? Is it the right time? And I guess my lived experience writer that I would offer you, as, as Nick offered his lived experience, my lived answer would be, for me personally, my wife turned out to be right. She was the one that said, Jim, we've got to, you know, I want to move forward with this. I want you to be willing to do this. And I said, yes. And then we ultimately attempted to have a child. We conceived and we had our first child. And I was broke as a joke at that time. I, I had nothing. Um, we didn't own a home. Like we were trying to figure it out. But I was so scared of being ill-equipped to have a child and not being ready for it. But it turned out it was okay. Like, right. humans have been making humans forever. Right. <laughs> like, when we were living in dusty plains and savannas, we were making humans and they were alive. You know, so, like, you can do this. The conditions are never ideal, never perfect. But if this is something you authentically want, it's so important, I think, that you grapple with that fear. And essentially, I think it's the roller coaster effect. You get in line and you feel scared all the way up to the clank of the last gear, like whenever you're climbing up that that tallest point, and then it goes and you just hang on and you'll be okay. You know, yeah. and I think most people that have had children will tell you it's going to be okay. It will work out. If this is something you want, you're going to be fine. Don't let that fear stop you from living out something that's authentically true for you that you want. Right. And this goes back to something that I think we talked about last week in an episode where we had somebody write in, uh, Richard actually wrote in about making big business. decisions. Yeah, business right? decisions. And the same thing I told him last week was that, at least in my experience, I have this flawed way of thinking where I view big decisions as one will equal my life being very happy and one right. will equal my life being miserable. Yeah. And I don't know which is which. Mm-hmm. When in reality... I do truly believe my life is going to be good in either situation. Right. And so kind of similar to this. Yes, you can choose to have children and your life could be wonderful and great. You can choose not to have children and your life could be wonderful and great. Yes. Either way. 
Yeah. I think that kids also have this terrorizing effect on a mentality where you're like, oh my gosh, once this little human needs me for everything, am I equipped? Do I have everything? Do we have enough towels? Do we have enough room? Do we have enough, you know, milk in the fridge? Like, do are all my bills paid? Do I have enough money in the bank? And it's and that's a, a, an authentic feeling because I think it's a desire to protect. It's a desire to not hurt a human being who might need you. But it also falsely concludes, as Nick pointed out, the stakes. Like, you're putting the stakes way higher than they need to be. Infants are pretty damn manageable. <laughs> they just drink their milk and they poop and then they pass out. <laughs> and like for the first and like the, the complexity of a child, you know, assuming no crazy healthcare conditions or anything like that, their their complexity and level of attention that's required advances as your parental abilities advance. You are not prepared to be a parent before becoming a parent. You can go read all the books, you can do whatever you want to prepare for this, you can try to get everything in order. It's never enough. You learn as you go. It's the same, like, what is it, the, the old uh, story about uh, military tactics or, or football strategies? Yeah, the strategy's uh, completely useful all the way up to the first snap. Like, and then once the game is in or action, is, now we're just playing. We're learning as we go. <laughs> or as like, Mike, Mike Tyson says, everybody's got a plan until they get punched punch in the face. face. <laughs> everybody's got a plan. Yeah. And that's what it is to be a parent writer is, you know, there is no amount of prep you can do to be ready for it. You just show up, you do your best work, and then you learn to be a parent as you go. And if that's something you authentic want i encourage you but you know i think nick's right if there's any amount of hesitance you might want to sit down with a therapist for a little while and tell them i'm here to figure out is this what i want and if so how do i jump over this last hurdle of anxiety to try to tackle this yeah. but um yeah i think we're both encouraging you to to reach for authenticity i think yeah. that's our answer to, to from both sides of how we could interpret your life and it's great that your uh, husband is on board and yes and way supportive. to not be a dick scoopasaurus is uh, husband exactly that's what we're talking about <laughs> we're on team civility yeah we've reached the end of the show nick we have some announcements some apologies you want to take on the announcements part and i'll uh cue up sure. my apologies yeah we've got uh our fantasy football league is going uh very well um everybody here i know is rooting for smitty to finally take down leon <laughs> somebody's getting, gotta do it it's getting a little high and mighty <laughs> with his seven and one record oh god i uh, want smitty to get one <laughs> uh but yeah andrea dactyl she and, changed uh, her name <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Borderline of Scrimmage are currently leading their divisional rankings uh, with Leon Kassab being 7-1. and one. Yeah, for now, until for now. Smitty finally dethrones him. So, not bad. Neither neither you nor I is uh, in the leader chair nope. uh, for our league. <laughs> I can't even see the leader chair from where <laughs> I'm at. <laughs> I mean, mine's competitive. I would not want to be in your side. Like, your division is, like, you guys ain't getting anywhere. No. Unless Borderline loses every game. Yeah. I still think he wins. Yeah, I think he, that I think he's, he's that deep in the victory. He's pretty much got it right. I think up, he's I think. got you guys. So, you might be fighting for second spot, but in mine, it's actually competitive. Uh, but we do have some apologies, Nick. I have a few things I want to say, and I hope Jacob's listening to the first one because um, I think it involves him. I'm not. <laughs> Dear Mom, I'm sorry that through my association with Matt and Mattingly's Ice Cream Social, that tens of thousands of strangers across the planet associate you with a squeaky-voiced, uncontrollably defecating, jelly-cooking, and enthusiastically blood-gargling vampire fruit bat... I'm not sure how this happened. <laughs> I don't think it will ever go away. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure people will be dressing up as this character in a year. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's okay, son. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Snoop Dogg, I'm sorry that when I heard of your new TV show as Martha Stewart's sidekick that I said you weren't gangster enough to be on the same stage as a convicted felon who has served time in federal prison. I'm also sorry that I said Martha Stewart makes you look like Carlton from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Stay fresh, Snoop. So you knew Shots that that's fired. who it was. Uh, yeah. You knew it was both yeah, of those uh, people. Yeah, that's pretty easy. Whatever. Yep. Well, we have Patreon stuff to do. Uh, if you will take on uh, Pals and Pods, the newbies, I will take on uh, the, the big thank yous because this is the first episode of November. So we have a yes. lot of thank yous to dish out. Yes. So uh, thank you to our new Therapal, uh, Sally Boop Scoop. Sally Boop Scoop. And uh, thank you to our new Therapod, Therapods, Don Dore and Creamer Jean. Welcome to the party. And we have some new Theradactyls. Uh, Andrea Anderson, a.k.a. 
Andrea Dactyl, <laughs> uh, Dan Martin, Leon Kassab, Cindy Ash, and Brian Lehman. Pretty much our entire fantasy football league all became uh, Theradactyls. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty tempting. It actually tempted Dan Martin away from being an ex officio <laughs> board member. I think he was like, oh, that's way cooler. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm doing this. So we uh, it's the first uh, week of the month, and so we want to thank all of our Therapods and our Theradactyls. We'll start with the Therapods. Thank you, Adam Rybikzik. <laughs> I always like how he says it's pronounced as it's spelled. Brad Kefauver, Brooks Lyle, who actually met in person, really cool guy. Chelsea Saracen, Corey McTitz, Craig Little, Creamer Jean, welcome to the party. Curtis Kiwi Fruit, Scoop Hanlon, Don Dor, welcome to the party. Easy Whip, Fred Bashara Jr., Gavin Bristow, Heather Psychotic Scoop, Crace, uh, Ian Whitefowl, James Cole, Jessica Vint, a.k.a. Scoopy Scoopy Jess Jess, Jim Hunter, Joseph Pengrazio, Carrie Terhark, who needs to send us uh, uh, awesome pictures of you in a Care Bear costume at some yes. point. God, I hope she still listens to the show. Kate Keller, Katie, oh, Kate, Kate Keller, by the way, working on art that uh, could actually go on our Patreon to be the Therapod and Theradactyls. Oh, cool. So, yeah, we're working on that project now. Uh, Katie Chiwil, Chi, Chi, Chiwalski. Why, yep, that one. Kenneth Liu, Kenneth Soto, Lori Eltsroth, Linda Brandmeier, Lindsay Bashara, Manuela Musaku, Matthew Nyer, Malaya, Oki Scoop, Peter Van Pelt, Richard Bruins, cool dude from Canada, liked him a lot, Richard Paulson, Scoopaholic, Scoop at her ascending, cool dude, Scoop Stranot, Shayla Bullock from Utah, I accept her anyway, Stacy Westerlin, aka Frozen 49th, Terrible Monkey Scoop, who actually showed up in today's show, and my mom, who is not a bat. Tracy Replogle. We also want to thank all of our new Theradactyls. As soon as we launched the Theradactyl thing, uh, we mostly did it just to acknowledge people that were already at better than $10. But a bunch of people just jumped into the box, because why wouldn't you? It's called a Theradactyl. So very special thanks to Andrea Anderson, Brian Lehman, Dan Martin, David Pollock, Ice Blue Scoop, Leon, or Leon Kassab, Tom Morrison, and Cindy Ash. And we especially want to thank our bosses, the Elite Eight and Mysterious and Shrouded Illuminati members of our fan club, the Thera Producers. Thank you, Smitty Scoop, Jake Schneider, Robert Brownie, Junior Mint, Chairman of the Board, Kayla Lansbury, David Data Scoop Vialon, Judy Schneider, Nathan's Hot Dog Scoop, Dr. Ben Don, and ex officio board member Ellie O'Dare. Who gave us this very interesting quarter. Yeah. That is still sitting between us, Nick. Yep. And it's probably going to stay there. I might need a <laughs> tissue <laughs> to pick this thing up. If you would like to hear this episode uncut and unedited and enjoy our spontaneous side projects like Book Club and Pod Therapy Fantasy Football League, you can go to www.patreon.com slash therapy and thank you all for supporting mental health. That's all the time that we've got for this week's session. We want to thank our landlords, the Ice Cream Social Podcast, and thanks to those of you who contributed to our show today. We really appreciate it. Remember, pot therapy isn't something you should keep all to yourself. Share this episode with someone who needs it by opening this episode's description in your podcast app and copying and pasting the link provided into your social media. Don't forget, you can find us at facebook.com slash podtherapy, on Twitter at podtherapyguys, and at patreon.com slash therapy. Do you want to submit a question to the show? Ask anonymously at www.podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. I'm Nick Tangeman. I'm sipping on gin and juice. Thanks, and we'll see you for your appointment next week. So I'm already scared that I'm about to get smashed on social media and in hate mail.